You are now in possession of the Aperture Science handheld portal device. Welcome back. This time around, I was able to focus more of my time on building out test chambers. I got two more done, and uh, there's still some small details I need to fix in them. But for now, I plan on building out the essential parts and then coming back later to polish them further. One part of the game engine I hadn't finished before this version was loading levels from the cartridge. Before, the entire game could fit into RAM, so everything was loaded when the game booted. The final game is not going to fit into RAM, so I needed to implement unloading the current level and then loading the next level from the cartridge. This kind of level transition is now implemented between test chambers 1 and 2. I was also able to put work into the physics engine for this build. Uh, my goal was to get infinite falling working. You could almost do it from a pretty early build, it's just that you'd eventually build up so much speed from falling you'd pass through the floor. Now you can fall forever from one portal to the other. And there are two things I did to resolve the issue of falling through floors. First, I checked how the original game enforces the speed limit. It turns out to be pretty simple. Whenever the player passes through a portal, it checks their speed. If it is above a certain value, it slows the player down to that limit. This solves the problem of picking up endless speed. But even at this speed limit, the player can pass through walls. This is because objects move a certain amount each frame. It can start on one side of the wall one frame and move far enough to end up on the other side of the wall the next frame. And at the frame rate Portal 64 runs at, about 30, I still need a way to detect when fast moving objects would pass through a wall. The solution is to create a new shape by stretching a collision shape from its original location, the previous frame, to the location of the collider on the current frame. This stretched collider will collide with the wall no matter how fast the player is moving. The next trick though is determining how far the object moved before it hit the wall and moving it back to that position. I also need some way to stretch the collider. Fortunately, GJK and EPA solve these problems in a very simple way. And they're just some algorithms in math and computer science that just, like, sing. They're like seeing a beautiful work of art in the way they take a complicated problem and solve it in a way that's really simple and elegant. GJK is one such algorithm. The name GJK comes from the creators of the paper, Gilbert, Johnson, and Kirthi. But to understand how it works, first you need to understand a concept called the Minkowski difference. This is a construct where you take all of the points inside of one shape and subtract it from all of the points in another shape. The resulting shape looks like the combination of the two shapes as if you took one of the two shapes, inverted it, and then slid it around the outside border of the other shape. The Mazowski difference has a lot of interesting properties that make it useful. You don't actually need to construct the entire Mazowski difference between two shapes to extract that information. Instead, you only query for the few points you need to answer any specific question about the shape. One property of the Mazowski sum is that it will contain the origin if and only if the two shapes that constructed it overlap. This makes intuitive sense. If two shapes overlap, then they both contain the exact same point. If you subtract a point from itself, you get the zero vector that sits right on the origin. So to determine if two shapes overlap, you create the Mazowski difference between them, and if the resulting shape contains the origin, then the two shapes overlap. And the only information you need to determine if the Mazowski difference contains the origin is finding the point on the shape that is furthest in any single direction. What you use to determine this information is called the support function. And it works kind of like putting a ball inside the shape and then changing the direction of gravity to the direction you want to test. The ball will then fall in that direction until it reaches the point where it can't fall any further. This is the point returned by the support function. This support function, which takes a direction and returns a point, is all the information you need from a shape for collision detection. This is what's so amazing about this algorithm. It becomes trivially easy to add new shapes to the physics engine. You only need to implement a simple support function and it can collide with any other shape. You still with me so far? This is getting kind of technical. Sorry if you were here just to see progress on a game port. And instead, we're hit with a math lecture. So how do we use this information to determine if a shape contains the origin? Well, first you can start by picking any direction. 
and then you use the support function to determine the corresponding point that's furthest in the direction. This point is now called the simplex. The simplex can also be a line, a triangle, or in the case of 3D, a tetrahedron, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Next, you find the point on the simplex that's nearest to the origin, and then you find the direction from that point to the origin. You then use the support function to find a new point in that direction. You then take this new point and add it to the simplex. So in this case, it goes from being a point to a line. We then repeat this. So we now take what is a line, find the point that's nearest to the origin, take that point, the direction from that point to the origin, and then use the support function to find the point furthest in that direction, take that new point and add it to the simplex, now giving us a triangle. We now take the point that's nearest to the origin from the triangle, take the direction from this point to the origin, use the support function once again, get a new point. And this time, instead of just adding it to the simplex, we can actually remove a previous point, keeping this as a triangle. You repeat these steps over and over again until either you find a triangle that contains the origin, proving that the shape contains the origin, or you determine that the origin is outside the shape when you use the support function to find a point in the direction of the origin, but the origin is still further past the point returned by the support function. So going back to the idea of stretching a collider, you can actually do that pretty trivially with a support function for GJK. To do this, you take the starting position of the object and the final position of the object. And then in the support function, whichever of those two points is further along in the direction you want to test, you use that as the center of the shape and then compute the support function normally. This just works seamlessly with GGAK, making swept collision detection actually pretty trivial, allowing me to test when fast moving objects would pass through a wall. And now that I can do swept collision detection, fast moving objects no longer pass through walls. Although I can't promise that you will never be able to pass an object through a wall. Um, there still are some engine bugs that I need to work out, but I'm definitely moving in the right direction. And with that, that's everything I have for this update video. Um, I'm hoping to have two more levels again for the next update with even more engine improvements. And before I wrap up this video, I figured I would show you the two newly added chambers in their entirety. Here they are. You're doing very well. Please be advised that a noticeable taste of blood is not part of any test protocol, but is an unintended side effect of the Aperture Science Material Emancipation Grill, which may, in semi-rare cases, emancipate dental fillings, crowns, tooth enamel, and teeth. Very good. You are now in possession of the Aperture Science handheld portal device. With it, you can create your own portals. These intradimensional gates have proven to be completely safe. The device, however, has not. Do not touch the operational end of the device. Do not look directly at the operational end of the device. Do not submerge the device in liquid, even partially. Most importantly, under no circumstances should you... Please proceed to the chamber lock. Mind the gap. Well done. Remember, the Aperture Science Bring Your Daughter to Work Day is the perfect time to have her tested. 